Okay, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Art and the Holocaust. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Stephen Smith and I'm going to be moderating the panel today. I am delighted to be joined by uh, four amazing people who are going to be talking about our subject. Miriam Caton, uh, graph graphic novelist, uh, artist and survivor of the Holocaust, is joined by Esther Finder, who is involved in an organization called Generations of the Shoah International and is the child of Holocaust survivors and has been interviewing survivors for many years and uh, is a, a huge contributor to memory and education in our field. Sandra Scheller, um, author of Try to Remember, Never to Forget, and is cur curator of a, a wonderful exhibition, if you've not seen it, um, Chula Vista, San Diego County, uh, about Ruth and uh, her mother. And those of you who were at Comic-Con a few years ago will have met Ruth, her mother. What a wonderful experience that was for all of us who were there now of blessed memory. We're also joined by Matt Dunford, World War II historian of comics and graphic novels, uh, gra graphic comics, and he's chairman of the Comic Fest San Diego. So a tremendous panel we have here today. Some of you may remember um, in 1993 that Steven Spielberg made a movie called Schindler's List. And after that movie uh, began an organization called the Shoah Foundation to interview survivors of the Holocaust. I'm executive director of what is now today the USC Shoah Foundation. And there are 55,000 testimonies of witness to the Holocaust and to genocides that have happened around the world. And one of the things that I have noticed over the years is just how many witnesses of the Holocaust have turned their their experience, not only to testimony in words, but also in art. And if you go to the USC Show Foundation's website and look and just type in a search keyword, you know, artistic representations or artwork, um, you'll find many, many Holocaust survivors who have turned their attention to art. And I've been very privileged to know a number of them. Today, uh, we're joined, first of all, by Miriam Caton. And uh, I went to Comic-Con for the first time five years ago and walked in and the first thing that I saw on a, comic, a bookstore at Comic-Con was this book, Letting It Go. And as a Holocaust historian, I noticed straight away the swastika up here and had no idea at that point just how amazingly influential uh, the period of the Second World War and the Holocaust has been on the comic world. Um, it has been a pleasure to get to know Miriam Caton. And for those of you who would like to hear her full story, um, Miriam gave a testimony to the USC Show Foundation very recently, and it's available for you to hear. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Miriam Caton. Thank you. I'm just going to, Miriam, I'm just going to share the screen so that people can see your slides. Okay. All right. There we go. Thank you. And uh, you can now go to the first uh, slide. Thank you. Hi, I'm Miriam. Thank you for including me in this panel. My book, this graphic novel, we Are On Our Own, is about our escape and life in hiding during the year 1944 to 1945. The stories my mother told me about our survival and the fate of our family, they were like a constant running narrative in my mind through the years, an unwanted, uninvited presence, a narration sometimes in the third person. They begged to be told. But I'm not a writer, and besides, I thought, who needs another Holocaust book? After I discovered comics for myself at age 63, I embraced the idea that I can draw my stories. It's called a memoir, but I had to change our real names because my mother, who approved the creation of the book, only demanded that I won't use our real names and the places we stayed in somebody might take offense and come and get us. My publisher was not happy about this, but I explained that this is part of the story. Such is the paranoia of the victims of wars. My publisher chose this panel for the inside covers, and now I see how wise they were. It really shows the loneliness of the, in that storm. We were truly on our own. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. Most of my story starts with the beloved city, Budapest. We loved her. We felt, we felt very much part of her until they explained to us 
that we are not, we don't belong at all because we were Jews, not Hungarian. Next, please. My mother told me about a small printing shop across the street from our apartment house in Budapest. In 1944, the Germans took over this printing shop and they printed Nazi propaganda in it. I imagined that flag flying outside our window, darkening our room, soon blocking our life itself. Next, please. The Jews were ordered to move into the ghetto in Budapest, but my mother did not obey. She purchased fake identification papers for us, and we left the city on a train as a peasant woman and her illegitimate child. But first, she was advised to destroy all evidence of our former lives. Next, please. After the war, my parents did not talk much about it. Nobody did really, not about the past. So I learned about the details of the year much later in life. But there was one scene my mother described to me many times. Uh, she pulled me in a suitcase over the snow as we were running for our lives from some Russian soldiers. Growing up, this was such a strong image in my mind that now I believe it was the main drive to create this book. Next, please. At some point, my publisher, Chris Oliveros, or Drone and Quarterly, asked me, what about color? I answered that I see that world of the past in black and white and gray tones, probably because the old photographs, especially these two, that my father brought back from the war. There you can see his trying to keep dry on the right, dry and, and warm, and his friends carrying what looks like dinner. Throughout my childhood, these pictures scared me and made me sad, but ultimately they inspired the style I was working with for this book. I keep hearing catharsis, catharsis. I hate that word. It's a buzzword and I don't like buzzwords. But the truth is, in the past, if someone asked me, you were born in 1942 in Hungary, a Jew, how did you survive? I would choke up and I answered, not now, I'll tell you some other time. But after the book, now I can actually talk about that past. I never expected such interest in my work. And at first I resisted to become the Holocaust lady going to synagogues and book clubs and talk and talk. But after a while, and with schools asking to teach their story, I had to take responsibility for what I created. Thank you. Miriam, thank you. Um, I want to ask you just one question before we move on to Sandy. Um, you'd explained there so carefully and you can see so clearly in the, the uh, images that you've created here, the intensity of the emotions that uh, go with uh, retelling this story in a graphic form. Um, what was it like for you to begin that process? Was that a, a difficult and painful process or was it one that came very naturally to you? Well, it was painful because uh, throughout the years, I would say, there was those short comments. Uh, we had to pack up everything. I had to burn everything. We, we, went, we, we went here, we went there, and nothing in depth. So what I decided with the book is to sit down and feel it and, and visualize it and really feel the words. What was it like? I had to burn everything, you know. I had to I'd somehow get into my mother's mind and life and past and feel it. So while once I decided to do the book by pencil on the paper, it was flowing out of me. But to to get to the to that point, mm. I had to just be with myself and really feel, and that was painful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're now going to turn to the issue of Nazi propaganda and uh, 
pleased to have with us today. Um, I believe Esther's going to be talking about this. Oh, Sandy's talking about Sandy. this. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Sandy. Welcome, Sandy Sheller. Thank you. Hi. I have to follow Miriam, Katen. Uh, it is extremely difficult because I could hear her for another hour. I just want to say, Miriam, I learned so much. And you're such a beautiful person. I truly appreciate you as well as the whole panel. Um, I'm Sandy Scheller, and um, as far as my involvement of getting into this, it was, we have a saying when I used to work in the circus, when you're not far from the circus, it's because you're in the circus. And in my situation, it's the same thing, that I'm the daughter of, uh, of Holocaust survivors. And for me to find out about the Holocaust was a little bit different, it's on my YouTube page, um, where I did a TED talk. But as I was taking care of my mom after losing my father, um, I thought my mom was going to die. And the best thing I could do was write a book. And here's the logo of the book. I didn't put my mother on the book, but it makes you question on the book as far as what is this logo. And what this means is that um, it's my mother standing next to the dress that my grandmother wore in the Holocaust, which we still have. And so um, that's why I bring this to your attention. And um, what we're gonna do now is just talk about the propaganda. Um, the first thing you see is this beautiful Aryan baby. Um, and they had a contest and I think it was 1938. And we'll go to the next slide. And notice here that the baby that the Nazis chose, actually he was chosen by, uh, by propaganda minister uh, Goebbels, uh, chose a Jewish woman. She's still alive today and you can see Hesse uh, Levinson Taft still you know, holding the propaganda poster. And um, yeah, it, it was, it, this, this really was instrumental in me understanding as to why would this be happening? Why the Jews? Why are they going against us? What have we done so bad? So while I was helping with Ruthie, uh, this allowed me to ask her questions. And I asked my mom how far back you could remember. And as she started talking, the stronger she became. And um, next slide. So my mother was telling me about this children's book, an anti-Semitic children's book, The Poisonous Mushroom. And it was used in the classroom. Again, can you imagine in a classroom taking a book and talking so negatively and horribly about Jewish people. Believe it or not, this book surfaced on Amazon. So um, I don't know what to say, but I do use it in the exhibit in Ruth, our, our uh, exhibit that we have, which is not just for my mother, but it stands for Remember Us the Holocaust. And it's about 12 Holocaust survivors that survived the Holocaust came to the South Bay of San Diego. And if you're in Chula Vista, California, it's at the Chula Vista um, Museum, at, at, our, at our library in the museum. Next slide. Here's an example of what was used in the book. Okay, how to identify a Jew. Can you imagine if we did this today? So let's read just one of the pages. Just as it is often hard to tell a toadstool from an edible mushroom, so too is it often very hard to recognize the Jew as a swindler and criminal. One can tell a Jew by his nose. Really? And from the eyes, one can see the Jews in a false, deceitful person. Their hair is mostly dark and mostly curled. Next slide. Well, meet my family. Perfect example, look at my grandfather, my grandmother, and yeah, there's little Ruthie. And I'm the first to tell you, and as I join others, I'm Jewish and I'm proud. Next. My mother was telling me a story about how she heard about the propaganda. And this magazine, Der Sturmer magazine, was very instrumental in getting the word out. From 1923, my mother wanted to see a copy of this. So my grandmother asked her non-Jewish friend, can we see what this magazine is about? And the non-Jewish friend took the magazine without anybody looking, rolled it up, took it underneath. And when my mother and grandmother saw this, they were horrified by this. Can you imagine if we had this today? And I show this to you now because history repeats itself. 
It's so important. And what they're saying is he is to blame. Next. This is so amazing. If you look at this magazine, doing this today, who is the enemy? And then at the bottom, it says, the Jews are our misfortune. Wow. Next. Esther and I had a conversation yesterday about this. And my point here is that by 1945, the, the Nazis tried to include the whole family. I'm not saying exactly where the mother went, if it was in an office or as a nurse or whatever, but imagine the father's on the front line, the mother is working, and now they're trying to get children involved. When my mother was in liberation, my mother remembered speaking to a boy, asking him a question who had a bayonet, and I talk about it in the book. And she said, how old are you? And here he was standing with a bayonet, 16 years old. This is just a taste of what Nazi propaganda is. You can find it, again, our panel is about making you aware of the different things because we could go on for hours. We'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, what you see here is a prisoner's point of view, Leo Haas. He smuggled out his drawings in Theresian in the concentration camp. And you, what you can see here are the details. What I loved about Miriam Caton are the details that she drew. They were just amazing. And you can see here the extra rope that is being carried. Next. We have a woman by the name of Dina Babbitt, and her story is just unbelievable. She was in line ready to be killed in Auschwitz. And Dr. Mengele needed an artist to draw the skin tones. The camera was not able to get the skin tones. And somebody pointed out that, that Dina was an artist. And so imagine that she was removed from the line along with her mother, because she said, if I can't be with my mother, then what I'm going to do, it's not worth it for me to live. So she survived by continuing doing the drawings for Dr. Mengele. And she was also known for the back wall in the children's ward um, in Auschwitz and of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Dean is an incredible person. Next. So draw what you see, a collection of drawings. These are from Holocaust survivors. The book is still out and available. It can be a little difficult to get, but I have seen it in different museums. And um, this gives you an insight. Again, they couldn't talk about it, but like Miriam, they were able to draw it. And this is so important. Next slide. Talk about my own family. These were my two cousins, Kitty and Eva Bruno over. And on a personal note, my cousin was gassed in Auschwitz, but her artwork was found either under a pillow, under a bed. All this artwork was collected. The collection is at Yad Vashem, her art was found under the bed. And in 1960, as you could see, a postage stamp. And if you look, her name is on that. These items I have, my goal is to continue creating a place where other people can continue growing with museums. I believe that is my final slide. Sandy, I just have a, a question for you. I, I had the privilege of seeing the exhibition that you did in Chula Vista, and congratulations on You were the MC. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, well, it was great to be there. What was it like for you to sort of take that family history that relates so much to this global history of the Holocaust and bring that to your community where your mother, or your, your, where you live, and to bring it to your, to your local community? What was that experience like for you? I don't think I could have put it in a better community because with Chula Vista, we have truly one of the greatest mayors. And as you got to experience the people, it wasn't just about what I wanted to do. It's the fact that I had so much support. And when the going got tough, there were people around me from the Chula Vista Heritage Museum and the um, um, historical society that I belong to that really kept me going. The other thing is because Ruthie had just passed, I felt like she was on my back the whole time saying, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. I don't know if you know, but my mom was in the exhibit 
two before it went up two weeks before she passed so you could still feel her in the exhibit and my goal now is not to make this a burden for my family i want to make sure that i find a place and probably with your help i know that these items will go into a good place if they don't remain in chula vista well thank you we certainly miss her on this panel and uh, it's a, really a treasured memory that you've created of her experience and th th those of you watching this if you when you're next in san diego make your way to chula vista and see the experience of, of this wonderful exhibition thank you sandy thank you Stu. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce um, Esther Finder, who um, I got to know because, uh, Esther, you were working, taking testimonies of the USC Show, Found for the show Foundation uh, 25 years ago, and also a child of Holocaust survivor. So thank you for all that you've done to make sure the story is told. Um, I believe that you're going to talk to us now a little bit about the, the lasting legacy of comics and cartoons from the World War II era itself. So welcome, Esther. Comics and political cartoons were widely used during World War II <clears throat> and the Holocaust. Propagandists reached masses of people and did their best to promote their political messages. Today I'm going to talk about one artist we probably all know, Dr. Seuss, and how some of his messages from the war years are still relevant today. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Theodore Seuss Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss, was of German heritage. His, Dr. Seuss was a political cartoonist and illustrator who, during World War II, took on the role of educating Americans about the dangers of isolationism, Nazism, and racism. The next slide, please. We're going to look at some of the works of Dr. Seuss during the war years. He had a very realistic view of the world situation and knew eventually the U.S. would have to get involved in the war, despite the isolationist mood in the country. To his mind, isolationism was dangerous, and the more time it took America to get involved, the more time the Nazis had to build up their military and expand their power. Next slide, please. There were many people who had had enough after the Great War, that war to end all wars, right? Which we now refer to as World War I. They were not willing to get involved with another European war. Dr. Seuss tried to make them realize that hiding their heads in the sand was a foolish response to the events in the war. Next slide. I thought you might find this one interesting in light of our current global pandemic. I love this whole social distancing idea in this picture. Next. This was a Nazi propaganda poster. The perspective is from behind faceless supporters. And of course, they're saying, yeah, fatherland, everything is wonderful. Next slide. After Pearl Harbor, there was no longer any question about America becoming involved in an international conflict. This message involves patriotism and how you, the average, faceless, every man, should do your bit. Again, this perspective is from behind a faceless person. Next slide, please. Dr. Seuss tried to fight racism and discrimination. Look carefully at the last line below the Pledge of Allegiance. Those in the cellar included oppressed minorities. This image has Uncle Sam reminding industrialists that they should employ all people, black and white, just like you should use all the keys, black and white, on the organ. Next. All right, let's unpack this image. Atop this mountain of junk, stands legendary aviator Charles Lindbergh, who was very pro-Nazi and a leader in the isolationist movement. He is shoveling racist garbage from the Nazi anti-Semite stink wagon in America. The title, Spreading the Lovely Goebel Stuff, is a reference to the rabid anti-Semitic messages that came out of Joseph Goebbels' Nazi Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. What a fancy and impressive title that was in Germany 
of course, that was back in the day when propaganda did not have a negative connotation. Okay, let's go on. This is just as true today as it was when Dr. Seuss drew it. Because there was so much anti-Semitism in the United States, Seuss wanted to make Americans realize Jews were being murdered in Europe. In this image, Hitler is with Vichy French head of government, Pierre Laval. Laval's government organized the deportation of foreign Jews who did not have French citizenship to Auschwitz. According to the time of this image, whoa, you went too fast. At the time of this image, the horrific truth of Auschwitz and the gas chambers had not yet been revealed in its entirety to the world. Now you can go on. Next slide, okay. Just to demonstrate how insightful Seuss was, this drawing was made contemporaneously by a Jewish child imprisoned in Theresienstadt, a Nazi concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. Next slide. Which brings me to my final image, Adolf the Wolf. This image was designed to fight the America First movement. I'm going to let you digest this one for yourselves. Personally, I just love the expressions and the faces of the kids. Let's just take a moment to look at this one. One of the things we learned about ourselves as human beings during World War II and the Holocaust is that we can easily be swayed by propaganda. We have to pay attention to what's being pitched at us and be independent and critical thinkers today more than ever. Thanks. And thank you for that, Esther. And on that point um, that you just made in closing, you've been working now for over 20 years with the, the, the children of Holocaust survivors. And, and part of your mission, I think, is to build bridges between the generation of your parents and the generation that follow on that, and in the educational part of your mission. How would you bridge the, the message that you just gave about critical thinking um, in relationship to the stories of your, your parents' generation? That's a very deep question. Um, when I share with people the stories that my parents told me as I was growing up. Uh, I try to, to make it relevant and, and share that we're all human. And these horrible things happen to Jews, but they happen to people beyond just the Jews. And I also try to emphasize that it isn't just the Jews as victims, it's also the perpetrators. What does it say about humanity when you have someone who can one day take the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, and then the next day conduct medical experiments on human beings. I mean, the Holocaust was a watershed in human history, and this is something that everybody of all the generations need to appreciate. They need to really understand this. Thank you for that. Well, we're going to now turn to uh, Matt Dunford. I think it, when we look at the way in which uh, Sandy started this off by showing the power of propaganda, um, what we're going to see, I think, a little bit more building on Esther's point now from Matt is how art can be and has been used uh, to counter these narratives and to tell a completely other story. So Matt, um, pleasure to have you on today, Matt Dunford. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So as you can tell, I'm a very big comic book fan and a big World War II fan. And uh, Let's talk about uh, what I consider to be the most important piece of artwork produced during World War II. Next slide. Captain America number one. A little about this guy. Here is Captain America himself knocking Hitler in the face. This I consider to be the most important image produced during World War II because this was a pre-World War II involvement of the United States. America was not at war. Like Esther said, America was still just stuck in an isolationist policy. They did not want to get involved in war. But there was a guy who, or a couple of guys, who actually had some very strong issues with this. And if you go to the next slide, I want to talk about that guy. Jack Kirby, king of comics. He's the co-creator of Captain America. He goes Jack Kirby and Joe Simon, but I do not deny Joe Simon's contributions to the creation of Captain America. But for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to be talking about Jack Kirby. He also had a, a hand in creating the Hulk and the X-Men and Thor and 
Marvel was pretty much the house that Jack built, but Jack was a guy, he was Jewish. He was a New Yorker, he was a New York Jew. His real name was Jakob Kurtzberg. He was never ashamed of his Jewish heritage, but he wanted a tough sounding pen name. So he took Jack Kirby, sort of like Jimmy Cagney. And he heard a lot about the oppression that Jews were facing in Europe, and he wanted to take a stand against it. And so he said, you know, what better than to create a superhero that would stand up to the tyranny and, you know, light a fire under America's get it moving. So if you'll move on to the next slide, we'll go on to some more of this. So mainly, this is what was going on in America. Nazi sympathy. This is Madison Square Garden, which attracted 20,000 sympathizers for the Nazi party. As you can see, the Nazi flag next to the American flag. And uh, Jack had a lot of problems with these guys. And of course, after the uh, debut of Captain America number one, these guys had a lot of problems with Jack. They did not like the message that Jack was sending. And there'd be times when some of the uh, members of the Nazi party would actually uh, go to the Timely Comics office, which was the precursor to Marvel. They would phone up uh, the office and say, can we talk to Jack Kirby? And they say, there's three of us down here. and We don't like what you're saying about Hitler. And uh, Jack would go downstairs and he would throw down with three guys and they'd go off running. He was very serious about knocking out Nazis. So if you'll move on to the next slide. Jack here with his muse, his wife Roz. And here he is getting ready to go to war. Captain America was pre-war involvement. He set that message out and he was no slouch. He wanted to put his part in and he got his, he got his message to join the draft and he was sent off to Atlanta. And at first, he joined the United States Army as an auto mechanic, but he was probably the worst uh, mechanic on Earth, so he was reassigned as a rifleman. And he was sent off in 1944 to the north of France. He arrived on Normandy just a few days after the D-Day invasion and got to work as a rifleman. So if we'll proceed to the next slide. Being a rifleman did not work out for Jack because he didn't have it in him to do all that fighting. And he was in General Patton's unit. And he actually said, is there anything else that I could do? And they said, okay, what's your name? Jack Kirby. And they said, are you that Jack Kirby? He said, yes, I'm the one who drew Captain America. So Jack Kirby was reassigned as a scout. So Jack would go ahead of enemy lines and draw what he saw. He would go out and just see everything there and record it back and just show visuals of it. So this is a self-portrait that he did. And of course, scouts were necessary because photographic equipment and development was not readily available at the time. So Jack was very necessary, but, and Jack said, he figured they were trying to kill him. Because if you, if you wanted to kill someone uh, in your own unit, you would make them a scout because they were always the first to die. So he saw quite a bit of action. So we go on to the next slide here. Here's a portrait of his wife, Roz, that he had sent back to her some of his uh, sketching equipment, some of the pre, you know, getting back into comic stuff, the mid-war material. And if you'll proceed on to the next slide, some of Jack's wartime sketches. This is where things really start getting on the rough side because one time when Jack was sketching, he thought he had just done a simple military outpost, but later on, he realized he had sketched, he had been one of the first Americans to actually do an illustration of a concentration camp. And then later on, if you go on to the next slide, Stephen, he illustrated a lot of the carnage of World War II. This, of course, is some of the illustrated work of some wounded soldiers, but Jack also participated in the liberation of a concentration camp. When he saw some uh, German soldiers fleeing a camp in, in France, one of the locals asked, are you Jewish? There's something you should see here. And of course he opened some doors into one of the large, uh, large buildings and saw hundreds of gaunt individuals starving to the point of death, just walking towards him. These images would haunt Jack for the rest of his life. And he just kept saying, oh God, oh God. It's just, he said it was like they just left dogs to starve for weeks on end and the Germans just did not care about these people. It's hard to believe that one of the most defining figures in the world of comic books actually was one of the first to witness the atrocities of, of the Germans on the American side. And 
like I said, Jack would be haunted, waking up in cold sweats for the rest of his night, uh, the rest of his night life, just seeing this. And Jack always fought to let people know how proud he was about his Jewish heritage and create heroes that the world could be empowered with. And always remember that Jack was a great creator and the king of comics, and that's why we always honor his legacy, his wartime legacy, and his Jewish legacy. And if we'll proceed to the next slide. Aside from the comic book side of thing, there was also the animation aspect of World War II history. Now, Walt Disney, uh, sometimes people label him, oh, he was an anti-Semite, he, he was probably Hitler sympathizer. No, no, he hated Hitler, he hated Hitler. Hitler actually almost caused the collapse of Disney Studios because Walt Disney worked on his masterpiece, Fantasia. He knew it wasn't gonna be a big hit in the United States, but he could always count on the European audience to, uh, to you know, throw, uh, throw their dollars his way or euros or whatever the currency was at the time. But it's hard for a European audience to go see a movie when all your villages are being bombed and when you're under occupations from the Germans. And so sadly, Disney lost just about all of their money on Fantasia and Walt Disney, Walt Disney blamed Hitler for it. Walt Disney Studios was on the verge of collapse. And at this point, one last final saving grace, Walt Disney actually approached Lockheed, which was gearing up for some wartime efforts and said, is there anything that Walt Disney Studios can do to help with the war effort? And so suddenly Walt Disney Studios became a propaganda outlet. Uh, they, they shifted from making films and cartoons to educational videos to, you know, anti-Nazi rhetoric videos like we see here with Donald Duck and, of course, De Fierce Face, where he just, like, lampooned the Nazi rhetoric. You see also stuff like Education for Death, which is just going against and just calling out all the flaws and all the, mis and all the you know, just stupidity of Hitler's regime and just empowering Americans to join the war effort. And if you go to the next slide, another thing that he did was actually Walt Disney actually came up with logos for a lot of the military aircraft. And see here the legendary flying tigers. So the Walt, so Walt Disney Studios became this media outlet. And that is what saved Walt Disney Studios during World War II, that they could you know, easily show you, okay, here's a film on how to operate a tank or how to do this. And so it all comes together in this, the comics, the animation, and it shows the empowerment of America to join the war effort, to take down the Axis powers and unite a country under, under a shared grace. And so, like we said, it's a shared propaganda, it's shared artwork, and it's entertainment and empowerment and a wonderful piece of our history that we now see in this form today. Matt, thank you so much. Um, I've got a question for you um, about the influence, ultimately, of World War II, and in particular, the Holocaust um, on uh, the kind of the comic book world. I, I want to preface this by saying the image that you show from Madison Square Garden is, is really quite astounding to see the level of penetration that the, the Nazis had here in America. And I was reminded of a book of, uh, which came out a few years ago called Hitler in Los Angeles, written by uh, history professor Steve Ross at uh, USC. Uh, remarkable insight to landscapes that I pass on my way to work day in and day out that were former strongholds of the Nazis in Los Angeles. To what extent did this struggle against, you know, against darkness and evil um, and the overwhelming force of the Nazis to, you know, to overcome the world influence what we now see in comic culture? Well, the Nazis, they always make great villains. And of course, they still persist into this day. But of course, it just started off with, you know, Jack setting that trend and, you know, these comics, you know, coming into the front. You'd see, you know, you didn't just see Captain America doing it. Soon you saw Superman doing it and Wonder Woman and Batman and all these comic companies going over to war and they would have ads in the back saying buy war bonds, support the war effort. After you're done with this comic book, you know, send the paper in for, you know, for recycling. So, you know, every little bit helps. These messages, it's just like, you know, preserve resources, you know, loose lips sink ships because there was this idea that, you know, evil could be everywhere and, you know, unite against it and become a shared people and become a united people and stand against the oppression. And this is, you know, something that we should not do. It's like, you know, America should be heroic. America has the power to stand up against the Nazi regime and America could easily do this. And so Captain America is a definite, sta a definite statement 
against that isolationist policy that we have the power to do something. And it shouldn't just, it, Jack and Dr. Uh, Dr. Seuss shouldn't have had just said, you know, it shouldn't have taken, you know, an attack on Pearl Harbor to, mo to, to do it. We had the power to do it. And then of course, these symbols that everyone in America has the power to lend a helping hand, even if you're not a superhero. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Matt, very much. Miriam, I want to come back to you for a second. To what extent is your work, you've, you've been a commercial artist, graphic artist uh, throughout your life, but now, now that you've turned to tell your own story, to what extent is your, your work um, an act of testimony? Um, it was so personal for me to do uh, the first book and the second book. Both of them are really, really personal. So, um, it, it's other people who turned around and, and came in with the, the fact of testimony, that is testimony. I never thought about it that way. It just, just uh, you know, the, you and other people who read it and so much was, <laughs> so much is written about it. And I don't know how many doctor degrees in, in, in uh, Romania, in Budapest, in Germany, that they do about the book. But that's all. I mean, it, I didn't think about it at all that way. Uh, and are you continuing your work to tell more stories from your own life? Well, uh, you know, my life was, my childhood wasn't any longer than everybody else's. So there is nothing that way to do. But um, there is uh, some things about my father's military bicycle. He, he was in a military bicycle unit in World War II, and I'm interested in that subject. And um, some, my mother died in June, last June, I mean, exactly a year ago this week, she died, 101 years old. Wow. And yes, and so there are a number of things that I found and I have here piled up on my desk and other things too, and I just have to work on it, but you see, <laughs> that means pain, and, and and there's a little reluctance here. Just like with my second book, I had to deal with pain, and that's what I did. Now I have to deal with pain again, and and I, I'm a little, you know, slow on the thing. <laughs> well, thank you for allowing us to come into your studio. I see your your easel behind you and your desk, and thank you for allowing us to share a moment in your studio. At least Z uh, Zoom has allowed us to do that because normally we would have seen you on a panel in San Diego, but now we're actually in your studio, yes. which is wonderful. Uh, yeah. Um, finally, um, as we sort of come to a close, first of all, for those of you who um, want to see Miriam's testimony, you can just Google uh, Miriam Caton and show a foundation and we'll, you'll get to a lovely page about her work and you'll be able to watch what she shared with us and her testimony. And thank you for sharing that. Um, Sandy and Esther, final word from both of you. You're both children of Holocaust survivors and you've obviously put this panel together for a number of years now in order to be able to delve into art and the Holocaust from different perspectives. But what is it that you want us to come away from this panel with? Esther first. I just hope that people will look at the Holocaust through uh, different perspectives. Um, you know, I, Sandy and I both are always uh, willing to try any kind of vehicle to help promote education about the Holocaust. And this is something that was different. We thought we might reach a different audience. And we, uh, we hope that this has opened some eyes and, you know, sparked some curiosity and maybe people will go further. Yeah, and thank you for uh, sharing all that you have uh, with so many people across the world. And I, I receive your newsletter regularly and I always look out for it. So thank you for all that you do. Sandy, uh, you mentioned Dina Babbitt. Um, I was watching her testimony in the Shoah Foundation recently because I was actually interested in what happened to the Roma community, gypsies that were in Auschwitz. And of course, she painted um, that. In fact, this piece of artwork behind me by artist David Kassan, which depicts Holocaust survivors living here in Los Angeles, um, we were writing a book uh, for that, uh, the, for his uh, show that was in Los Angeles. And I went back to look at Dina's work because she literally painted the Roma in Auschwitz with Mengele. Um, her testimony is also available at the Show Foundation. Um, I, I so appreciate you bringing her to our attention because you're obviously uh, also trying to 
take us on this journey with this panel to bring together the world of, of artistic expression and what it means in the present. Um, what is it that you want us to come away from this panel this year thinking well, about? When I did my, my TED talk, it's based on keeping memories alive. So the fact is, I'm now 65, 66. Matt, you're still very young. And what has happened is we're looking at who the next generation <laughs> is that will talk about the Holocaust. For me, I'm close to her children. I know Karen and, and, and Michelle. And the fact is that we have to figure out how this will continue. And the more avenues that I try to do it, whether it's through comic or whether, you know, comics, graphics, if I have to do it in mind to tell the story, um, I, whatever it takes, it's about leaving a legacy for the next generation, not just with the physical items, but what the story is, because if this story is not going to be told anymore in all these different avenues, we're doomed. We're doomed. I've always said, and my mother taught me, you want to know about the future? Look at your, look at your past. Uh, Sandy Scheller and Esther Finder, Matt Dunford and Miriam Caton, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Stephen Smith and this panel was Art and the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. See you next year in San Diego. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bye. <laughs>